Over the last year or so, there seems to be an influx of indie titles that focus less on grand narrative experiences and instead on short self-contained play sessions with emergent experiences that can be different each time the game is played. The game system worked together in a seemingly random fashion to create a new game world with new conditions in each play session. While some feel this design style is leveraging the infinite monkey theorem to craft unique gameplay, I personally am a big fan of this type of design. I love the randomization in games like Azure Dreams, After That the Dark Cloud series, and most recently FTL. This design method has been around since the 1980s and has been deemed the roguelike subgenre for games featuring characteristics like random maps and permadeath. The latest addition to this bizarre subgenre is the Klee developed survival game Don't Starve. Now, let me preface this review by saying that at the time of this writing, Don't Starve is technically still in beta. Many of the things you'll see in this video may have changed. That includes any complaints or concerns I express regarding the game's design. So without further ado, let's dive right in, shall we? Don't Starve is a game about survival in the harsh wilderness. The game is presented in a top-down fashion featuring 2D sprites in a 3D game world. You'll need to gather supplies, craft tools, hunt for food, and a variety of other activities to increase your odds of living to see the dawning of a new day. As the player, that really is your main concern without much in the way of deviation. That's not to say the game is boring or mundane, though. While the premise and gameplay seem to be fairly simplified, there is a plethora of animals, plants, and objects to interact with, and they in turn react in a variety of ways. Now, even though the game is fairly simple, there is a complete lack of help system or tutorial at the time of this writing, so be prepared to die a few times to learn the ropes of the game. For instance, the player has three meters that they need to keep monitoring at all times. Hunger, health, and sanity. While hunger and health seem pretty straightforward, there isn't any clear indication on how to restore sanity until you've played around with the systems a bit to find that out on your own. Now some people might argue that that's kind of the point of the game, say that learning the systems is a large part of the fun. While I do agree with that sentiment to a certain degree, it would have been nice to have at least some type of explanation of the systems beyond the 5 second interaction with a suited man you have at the start of the game. Narrative-wise, that interaction is the only guided experience you'll find in the game. The rest of the adventure must be pinned by you as the player which I actually consider quite a good thing. Since the game does focus on emergent game design, the game world is randomized every time you play. There is a problem with this, however. With many games that rely on procedurally generated levels, they have to keep them very plain to make sure that the systems all still function without bugs. Don't Starve does fall into this pitfall, leaving very little variation to the supposed random world creation. Sure, the landscape may change its shape slightly, but there will always be a forest region, a grass region, and so on and so forth, with a flat ground featuring no hills, valleys, or caves. That's not to say the world isn't enjoyable, just don't expect to be stopping and marveling at the landscape from a mountaintop or anything like that. While I'm on the subject of bitching about the visuals of the game, it's kind of a bummer that sometimes the game's presentation can feel fairly monochromatic. Sometimes in the middle of the day, when you're supposed to feel the most at ease and safe, the world will consist mostly of a brown or a gray. The art style looks fantastic and is expertly crafted, so why the developer would choose to hide such beauty behind a haze of brown is a tad confusing. They may be simply trying to convey atmosphere, but it still just seems like a waste. I promise I really do like Don't Star, so for that reason, let me get the rest of my gripes out of my system so I can talk about what I loved about the game. First off, there is no controller support, and that makes a lot of sense with the interface choices that had to be made, but for those gamers who simply detest having to play a game with a mouse and keyboard, it's an important note. The map system feels a little unfinished as well. It would be nice to be able to mouse over one of the many icons on the map and have the game tell you what it is. Allowing the player to place icons and waypoints would be highly beneficial as well. Cartography is a very important and oddly therapeutic aspect of surviving in the wild, and it would be nice to see a more interactive and customizable map for the game. Another minor gripe is that some of the mechanics of the game seem like they should have been available by default, but are locked behind the use of special items. For instance, it would have been nice to be able to simply skip till morning if you're sitting around a roaring fire at nighttime, that way you're not sitting around watching the clock tick till dawn. While this functionality is in the game, the player must craft a usable bed. It wouldn't be such a thorn in the side if the bed was a multi-use item, instead you'll craft the bed, use it once, and then it's gone. Since the game is presented in a 3D world, you can rotate the camera, but doing so will cause a little bit of confusion regarding orientation. Since every actor or object in the game is a 2D sprite, the orientation will rotate with the camera. This means that if you're looking at the front side of a house, then rotate the camera 180 degrees, you'll still be looking at the front of the house, but the world itself has rotated. Alright, next up, the button mapping for the mouse can be rather confusing sometimes. You'll mean to place a plant and instead you'll just throw it on the ground. Right and left clickers sometimes swap from what you'd expect them to be, leading to some rather head-scratching moments. For instance, to use the pitchfork on the ground, you use the right mouse button, but for using the axe on a tree, it's the left mouse button. To get a description of an object in your inventory, you right click it, but for some objects, that will make your player eat the object even if you didn't want to. Alright, I've only got a few more minor gripes, I swear. You can't pick up or replace a wall once it's been placed, so a simple misclick can be a real bummer for an anal-retentive person like myself. 
An auto sorting option on the inventory would have been greatly beneficial, and the XP progression system used to unlock new characters and goodies feels a tad slow and leads to the player feeling like they're not making much overall progress and rather they're just spinning their wheels. There, that's all for the bad stuff. Now on to the stuff that I really loved about Don't Starve. The game has a fantastic sense of humor, the likes of which you'd expect to see in a Double Fine production. The characters are unique and fun, and even come with special abilities. Characters like Willow, a little girl who is obsessed with fire and has the useful ability of being immune to fire damage. While I may have complained earlier about the game's sometimes overzealous use of mainly brown, the art style is still something to behold and enjoy. The aesthetic is somewhat reminiscent of an old-time puppet theater with hand-drawn characters and objects. This should come as no surprise to fans of Klee Entertainment, though, as they are very well known for their dedication to making beautifully drawn characters and environments. Don't Starve upholds that tradition by being very unique and yet somehow exudes that trademark Klee style. The sound design of the game is highly effective as well. While there may be some sound effects that sound a tad off, such as chopping down a tree, the vast majority of the audio in the game is spot on and really lends to the creepy factor of nighttime play and the chipperness of daytime resource gathering. There are a few things more demoralizing than hearing the distant howls of a pack of hounds getting closer and closer as you frantically attempt to craft something that loosely resembles a weapon to try and fend them off. Production value and overall quality has been something building with each game Clay Entertainment releases, and Don't Starve is no exception. The addiction factor of Don't Starve is something to be wary of, as it's very easy to die, tell yourself, I can live longer than that, start up a new game and find you've spent two more hours than you initially intended in your futile attempt to establish a sustainable ecosystem in the game. That is to say, it is very addicting. While I still enjoy my grand narrative-based games and guided experiences, it's always nice to have a change of pace with a game like Don't Starve. It's a game that's fought its way into my short list of indie darlings, and doesn't look like it's going to be falling from that list anytime soon. And that's a real feat since the game isn't even technically out yet. So if you're on the fence about Don't Starve being worth the $15 price of admission, get down from there. I'm here to tell you that it is, and you shouldn't deprive yourself of such a fun and addictive bit of video game nourishment. Here is where I'd usually score the game, but I'm not going to do that since the game is technically still in beta. But if you're looking for a simple recommendation for the game, you've got one.